Hey, welcome to Trinity Harlem. My name is Taylor Wilkerson. My wife Kristen and I have the privilege and honor of being the lead pastors here. And I am so grateful that we can be together here at Trinity. Something that we say here is that you belong. But maybe you're joining us in the Zoom or you're on church online or on YouTube Live, or you're watching this on the podcast or on YouTube later on. No matter where you are in the world, I want you to know that you belong. That phrase isn't just a phrase here at Trinity. That's actually an identity that we have taken on. You see, when I was just an 18 year old kid running away from God, I was struggling with depression, I was struggling with alcohol, I was struggling with the self identity, and I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere in the world. And I met Jesus when I was 18 years old, and I felt like God told me that I belong. And here at Trinity Harlem, it's our prayer and our mission that all people would belong belong in a church, belong with people, but belong with God. So no matter where you are in your walk with Jesus, whether you're new to church or you've been coming for a long time, whether you're on the East Coast, the West Coast, whether in your bed or your living room, no matter where you are, I want you to know that you belong here. And I'm so personally grateful that you're joining us here today. Uh, I'm really excited because if you are joining us right now, Today is a very special day on September 20th because today we are launching our connect groups. I wanna take a second and talk about some of the things that are happening in the life of our church because it's so easy in this season to feel disconnected. In fact, studies show that Christians right now across America because of our distancing and not being able to gather in person are struggling with feeling connected. Studies show that if you miss three Sundays, just three Sundays in a row as an as a involved church member, that you feel disconnected. Well, Friends, we've missed a lot more than three Sundays. And that feeling of disconnect is gonna continue to persist until we get into groups. Uh, Connect groups, they're launching today. Uh, we have several of them gathering virtually. We have a few gathering in person, but no matter where you are, whether you're in New York City or on the, on the other side of the world, there is a community for you to be able to jump into, to be able to start building a relationship and to remain connected through this series. Now I wanna jump right into it today. I'm excited. Hey, if you wanna get connected, by the way, text connect to the uh, number on the screen, 646-713-2393, uh, however you wanna get connected. You, go, you can also go online, you can figure it out. You're a smart person. You don't need all these instructions. But today, I wanna jump right into it. We're going into a series, we're in a series right now called With the End in Mind. With the End in Mind. And, and the reason that we're in this series is because uh, I've had a lot of people asking me since the beginning of COVID and just kind of all the distress in our world today is people have been asking me, you know, pastor, is, is this the end? Is this what the end of the world looks like? Is Jesus coming back soon? Is the rapture happening? Uh, people have been asking me the question, is this the end? And, and to be honest, friends, the answer to that question is that, well, I, well, I don't know. And, and nobody does. Jesus says that the hour is unknown but that we need to be ready and we need to be prepared. Uh, we're in a series where we're talking about the end times, not because we wanna scare you, but because we wanna prepare you. And as we talk about uh, the tribulation and the rapture and the judgment of God, uh, this isn't supposed to be frightening. It's supposed to be exciting for the Christian. The person who has a right relationship with God knows, like I said just two weeks ago, that, that we're going to heaven and that we're not gonna suffer tribulation. And in fact, revival is knocking on our doorstep and God has us for such a time as this. But today, I wanna to continue our, our series as we're talking about the end times. And I wanna pick up in 1 John chapter four. I want you to read this with me. It says this, this is how you can recognize the spirit of God. So what John is saying is, this is how you know that God is a part of something. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. This is important because what he's simply saying is that, is that, is that any, any person or anyone who acknowledges that Jesus is Christ, meaning that he is God, that Jesus Christ is God who has come down in the flesh, that, that, that acknowledgement and that confession can only happen by the Spirit of God. But check this out, the next verse. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Okay, this is huge because obviously in our world, more people are not acknowledging Jesus as God than are. But this is what he says 
in the next, as he goes on, he says, this is the spirit of the Antichrist. You see, today we're in this series where we're talking about the end times. And there's a lot of conversation about the Antichrist. And a lot of people want to know what that is. And, and you'll hear Christians, they'll call political leaders the Antichrist. They'll call, uh, they'll call all sorts of people the Antichrist. And, and I don't know who the Antichrist is or when he's coming. But, but the Bible does talk about the Antichrist. But, 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 but more specifically, John, he's talking about the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, meaning that there will be a person there will be a leader who is going to come as a leader promising the hope of the world, promising to fix everything. They will be charismatic, that, that most people will follow them and celebrate them, but they will not actually be proclaiming the kingdom of God. They might be disguised like they are, but they won't be. But before getting lost in that, yes, there is an antichrist that will come. But what he says is that there's also the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. This is what I wanna to talk to us about today. The spirit of the Antichrist, which is already in the world. Already in the world. Meaning that, that the heart, that the spirit, that the motive of the Antichrist, maybe not the person or the actual figure that we see in the book of Revelation, is, is not physically here, but the spirit, but the heart, but the motives. And we see this in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, there's this concept of the four horses. And if, you, uh, if we go to Revelation chapter six, I wanna show you the spirit of the Antichrist because this is the spirit of the Antichrist. In Revelation chapter six, it says, I looked and there before me was a white horse. Now there's these four horses. The first one is this white horse. Its rider held a bow and it was given a crown. A bow. What is a bow? A, a, a bow is a weapon for uh, is a weapon for warfare. It's a weapon for disruption. It, 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 it's it, it's a weapon of warfare. And then a crown. It's a weapon of uh, of leadership. It's not a weapon. A crown means that it's going to be a leader. And he rode out as as a conqueror bent on conquest. Now most theologians think that this white horse represents the spirit of disruption and deception. Now. We see in 1 John that the spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world. And in Revelation, we see that there is this concept, this spiritual concept, that there will be the spirit of this white horse, which is the spirit of disruption and deception, meaning that, that, that the truth will not be told, that everything will be disrupted. And, and, and you know, people are asking me, you know, is this the end time? And of course, you heard my opinion two weeks ago. Uh, I think this is the beginning of the end. And that's why we have to live with the end in mind. But that's the first horse. It's the spirit of disruption and deception. So when we see massive deception, and when we see massive disruption, then we need to be alert as Christians to the spirit of the Antichrist. Maybe this is getting closer to the end. Uh, we go on and he says, then another horse came out and it was a fiery red one. Okay, so this is the red horse. Its rider was given the power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. Most theologians think that this red horse, the second horse, is the spirit of fear and of violence. Now, I don't need to remind us of the news headlines to, for us to believe that the spirit of fear and that the spirit of violence is alive and well in our country here today and across the globe. Now there's the third, the, 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 there's the third horse, the third spirit, and it says when the lamb opened the third seal, the lamb is Jesus. So this is God opening up judgment and, 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 and letting out the tribulation, which we can't get into today. But what we talked about a few weeks ago is that you and I as Christians, we will not suffer this, but I'll talk about it. I heard, he says, I heard the third living creature say, say come, I looked, and there before me was a black horse. This is the third horse now. And its rider was holding a pair of scales. A pair of scales. Scales were used back in the day. This is a signal for, for currency. Uh, it, it, was, it was how they measured and how they traded it, it scales, how you would weigh things. It was holding a pair of scales in its hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages. In other words, something that should be really cheap will be very expensive. Talking about massive inflation. Uh, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley 
for a day's wages and do not damage the oil and the wine. So most theologians think that this black horse represents economic collapse. This is economic collapse. This is when you see the, the, the world's currency start to fall apart. See, like I'm, I'm just trying to paint a picture of these horses of economic collapse, of, of disruption, of, uh, of, of, of fear and of violence. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. And I'm just trying to get us to agree that the spirit of the Antichrist is here, that, that these things are happening. And now there's the fourth horse. And this is the kicker. The fourth horse says, uh, and, and this is actually why I don't think we're at the end yet, because it says this, it says, I looked and there before me was a pale, <coughs> a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades was following close behind him. And it says, they were given the power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So it's saying that, that this fourth horse, that, that a fourth of the planet, that, I mean, like that's, what, is that two billion people would be killed by sword, famine, and plague. And, and when, when we see that happening, that's how we'll know that we're at the end of time. But this pale horse represents disease, this disease and death. And today, you know, I can, I can tell already, some of you jumped in here like, whoa, what are we talking about? This feels like, what, is this sci-fi? Like, well, pastor, this is some spooky stuff. No, 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 I'm not trying to scare us. I, I, I want you to see what theologians and what Christians believe uh, th that the Bible shows us about what the end time will look like, that the spirit of the Antichrist will be one where, where there will be violence, there will be death, there will be economic collapse, there will be disease, uh, that, that, that so much turmoil will fill the earth. And right now we're in a season where so much turmoil is filling the earth. And I'm not saying that this is the end, but you and I, we need to live as if it is. We need to live as if heaven is real. And we need, we need to live as if God has you and I here for such a time as this, to speak hope to the hopeless, to shine light in the darkness, and to be used by God in the midst of all of this division. Today, I'm here to encourage you. In Revelation, when they talk about the end of time, we see these four horses bringing all of this, all of this evil to the earth. And, and it's, a spiritual, it's a spiritual thing. And I love what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 12. I love this. Eugene Peterson actually has a book just about this verse. Jeremiah chapter 12 says, If racing against mere men makes you tired, how will you race against the horses? Jeremiah, the prophet of God in the Old Testament, God is speaking. And he's saying, hey, in this life, is you're just racing against men. You're going throughout your life, you're working, you're exhausted. If, if going throughout this life is exhausting you, if you're tired, if you're having a hard time keeping up as is right now, what makes you think that you'll keep up with the horses? Don't you think this is, you might be thinking, well, Pastor, I don't think I can race against horses. No, no, no. God's asking the question because with God, we can keep up with the horses. God is saying that we, is that we can run with the horses. God is saying that we, it, it, that we can run with strength. We can run with perseverance. We can run with speed. God, God has us here for such a time as this. He says, he goes on, he says, if you stumble and fall on open ground, what makes you think that in the thickets near the Jordan, what will you do in the thickets? What will you do when life gets hard? If you were falling when life was easy, what makes you think that you'll stand tall when life is hard? I, I, I love it because Jeremiah, he's painting this picture of running with the horses, of keeping up with, with something that you and I could never keep up with except for God. The author of Hebrews says it this way. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the cloud of witnesses is all the Christians who have gone before us. It's the reminder that heaven is real and that, and, and that God has sanctioned you and I to live on this earth to fulfill his mission. And we are surrounded by, by spiritual witnesses that God is helping us, he is for us. And we are surrounded by the spiritual cloud of, of, of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance 
the race marked out for us. Today, I wanna, I wanna take just another 15 to 20 minutes to talk to you about this idea to run with the end in mind. To run with the end in mind. You see, I believe that, that it's no accident that, that John's teaching that the spirit of the Antichrist is already in the earth. And that the revelation that we see on, uh, which teaches us the eschatology, that, that, that these four horsemen, which represent these spirits of, 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 of evil, which are violence and division and, and plague, and, and, and that all of that, that all those spiritual things, they are happening right now. And like Jeremiah says, but man, if you can't even run with humans, what makes you think you can run against the horses? Man, today, I wanna to encourage you because I want you to know that you can run with the horses. That in the midst of this season with so much turmoil and so much strife and so much pressure and, and, and so much lack, that you can run with strength, that you can run with perseverance, that you can finish the race that God has for you today. I believe it with all my heart. And I wanna show you how to do that. In fact, I, I, today I wanna give you four practical things that I believe the Bible tells you to do, tells me to do, to be able to run with the horses. Uh, it, 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 I get this teaching from 1 Thessalonians chapter five. And 1 Thessalonians chapter five, uh, four and five, is this really quick little snippet. If you wanna learn a little bit about end times and you wanna do some side homework, I'd encourage you just to open your Bible to 1 Thessalonians four. And, and right there about midway through four, all the way through the end of five, Paul gives a little bit of a snippet about the rapture and he talks about the end of times. But right at the end of chapter five, Paul gives like a list. You read it and you can tell like this is out of place. Like, like we're talking about the rapture and like all the like, like, like people who are, who are dead and but, but we don't like grieve as the, those who have no hope. And he goes in all this stuff, but then out of nowhere, there's like these really short, just like, like boom, boom, boom. There's these nine statements that I believe are a checklist for the end times. Meaning that, that I believe that right there in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, we get a checklist of what to do in the end times. When, when, when these spiritual things are happening, when this strife is happening on the earth, when life gets hard, I, I believe that we can actually just go back to that, to 1 Thessalonians 5 and say, all right, well, am I doing these nine things? If I wanna run well, if I wanna run with the horses, then I gotta make sure that I'm, I'm doing these five things. And, and if we're gonna run with the end in mind, believing that God uh, is coming back soon and we wanna run with strength, then we gotta do these nine things. And, and I'll, I'm gonna walk us through today just the first four. And next week, I'll talk about the next five. But today, I'm gonna talk about the first four. And the first thing, I'm calling it this. I'm calling it run with a covering. Run with a covering. And 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 12 says, Dear brothers and sisters, Honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. Honor those who God has placed over you. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work. Now, Paul, yes, he's talking about church leaders, but he's talking more than just spiritual and church leaders. He's talking about submitting to authority. And I know we don't always like to talk about submitting to authority, but but there's something that Paul's trying to show us here. When the horses are coming, when the end is near, we need to run with a covering. And he's saying that we need to run with this covering. And this covering uh, it really looks like four different things in our life. God, the Bible teaches us that God has placed four different types of covering over our life. There's this civil covering. This is mayors, city officials, this is congressmen, these are senators, this is police officers. These are the people that God has placed over our life and we're supposed to submit to their authority and we're supposed to submit to their covering because God gives us covering and because, I love what it says, honor those who are leaders in the Lord's work. The point is, is that they're supposed to be 
taking care of us. They're supposed to be leading us for our benefit, not for our oppression, but for our benefit. Now, you and I know that the world is fallen and not all civil leaders are leading for our benefit, but that doesn't change the fact that the Bible tells us that we're supposed to submit to that covering. Now, I wanna, I wanna show you because the Bible teaches us that we, we're supposed to submit to our civil covering. Then, then we're supposed to have a spiritual covering. This is your pastors, your team leaders, your connect group leaders. If today you don't have a spiritual covering, uh, if you're not in a connect group, if you're not serving on a team, then it's possible that you're coming to church, but you don't actually know someone that you can call when you need prayer and you need spiritual leadership. I'd encourage you to get into a connect group if that's you. I'm so thankful for my spiritual covering, for, for, for the board of directors who covers me in prayer and, and I can always go to when I have any situation for, for my father, my pastor, and for my brothers who lead other, I'm so grateful for the people I have submitted myself to. When, without submitting to a covering, man, there is so much the enemy can do to attack us. But, but, but we have these, the idea of a, of a civil covering, that there's a spiritual covering. God gives us a, a, a vocational covering, but meaning that, that, you're, that you're a boss, that you're an employee, that you're just not out doing life on your own, but, but, but there is a covering there. And then there's a, there's a family covering. Uh, one of the 10 commandments is to honor your parents. In fact, in fact it's, it's the only one of the 10 commandments that comes with a promise meaning that if we honor the authority God has placed over us, God says, I will give you long life and prosperity on the earth. Man, that's a really powerful thing. And, and I gotta be honest, this is hard for us. This is hard for so many of us. We don't, we don't really wanna submit to a covering because it feels oppressive and it feels limiting. But man, friend, I will tell you something, that once I learned how to get under a covering, that's where real flourish, flourishing begins to happen. That's where I began to really understand being a part of the body of Christ. It's not about which church you're watching on Sundays. It's not about which building you're getting into. It's about which spiritual authority are you submitting to? Which family, spiritual and real, are you in today that God is calling you to get under their covering, to make sure that you're being led and that you're covered so that the enemy's attacks cannot get to you? The, the, the truth is, is that we have to run with covering because it's a simple fact that we, we're, ju we're always just better together. We're always better together. So we have to run with a covering. Run with a covering. So today, hey, I, I told you, 1 Thessalonians 5, it has a list. If you're gonna run with the horses at the end of time, at, at, at the end time, I think it's an end times checklist. You've gotta go through it and you've gotta ask yourself, hey, am I doing number one? Am I running, am I run, running with a covering? And the second one I'm calling this, I'm calling it run with ministry. Run with ministry, that's what Paul says. He says, brothers and sisters, we urge, to, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. I love that. He says, warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, and take tender care of those who are weak. Warn, encourage, and care. Man, that is ministry. Paul is saying, he's not just talking about those who are, you know, like pastors in the church or staff members in the church. He's saying each and every one of us in the end times, we gotta make sure that we're warning those who are lazy. Hey, it's time to get to work. God has something for us that we're here for such a time as this. Like, like don't slack off. Are, are you helping build the kingdom of God? Are you, are you walking in your calling? All those things. Encourage those who are timid. Hey, let me encourage you. Let me pray for you. Let me prophesy over you. Let me let you know that God has a plan for your life. Take tender care of those who are weak. Meet people where they're at, serve their needs. All things that our church is doing, but things that God is calling you to do, to run with ministry. I think this is so important. It's so easy in this time for us to just be overwhelmed with all the bad things that are happening in this world. And Jesus, he gives us a little bit of, a, of an insider's look at that because Jesus says, now my soul is troubled, what shall I say? My soul is the emotional part of me. Jesus himself says, hey, when my soul is troubled, what, what, what do I say? Do I say, God, save me from this hour? God, I don't wanna be here. Take me out of COVID-19. I wanna fall asleep until quarantine's over, right? Like, like, deliver us from this problem. No, Jesus says, don't ask God to take you from this. He says, no, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Friends, God called you to, 
to New York City, to your city, to Miami, to wherever you are today, God called you for such a time as this. God called me to pastor in New York City in 2020 during the pandemic of 2020. God called you to be a teacher, to be a mom, to be a dad, to be a lawyer, to be a builder, to be a creative in this season so that you can shine light in the darkness. God, friend, God has a ministry for you to do in this season. There are people for you to care for, people for you to encourage. Friends, you have to run with ministry. And maybe today you need ministry. Maybe today you need care. Maybe today you need encouragement. Maybe today you're feeling lazy. Can I tell you a, a little bit, a little bit of a secret about life? Huge secret about life is that the solution to needing ministry is to do ministry. I don't know how else to tell you. This is, something is so amazing about the way God created you and me. Did you know that, that psychology shows us that the highest need of a person, the highest need of, of, of human beings, this is secular science, says that the highest need of a person is something called transcendence. There's, there's Maslow's eight, uh, eight laws of, uh, of needs, hierarchy of needs. Maslow's eight laws of needs, that's what it's called. And there's like needs like, like safety, you know, like love is one of them. There used to be five, and five, the highest one, was called self-actualization. And that meant, hey, I've realized who I am and I'm walking out my purpose. But since then, they've added three more, and the highest, there's no, five was self-actualization, meaning I become the best version of myself, but now the highest version, number eight, is called transcendence, meaning that I have, not only have I reached the highest version of myself, but now I help other people reach the highest version of themselves. Friends, that's ministry. That God wants you to run by walking out your God-given purpose on this earth. It, it, friends, if you don't know why God has called you, if you don't know why you're alive, Mark Twain says there's the two most important days of a person's life is the day they're born and the day they discover why. Do you know why you were born? Do you know what God has for your life? He has a ministry and he has a mission just for you and you need to be walking out the specific purpose he has for your life today. I believe it with all my heart that God wants to empower you and equip you and that he wants to prepare you to be alive for such a time as this, to run, with ministry. Now, the amazing thing about the study about the eight, the hierarchy of, of needs, the eight laws of the hierarchy of needs, whatever, how, I'm not a psychologist, but the, the amazing thing about it is it points to this truth, that the highest need you and I have is to actually serve others. And that's what ministry is. Ministry is serving God by serving others. And so maybe whatever you think you need in ministry today, the encouragement you need today, man, if you need encouragement, I'd encourage you to give some encouragement. Hey, if you need some prayer, I'd encourage you to give some prayer. Whatever it is you're needing today, I'd encourage you to do. Here at Trinity, if you're interested in being a part of ministry, it's why we have Growth Track. If you're interested in becoming a member of our church, you take the Growth Track, but really Growth Track exists to help you discover your purpose. <coughs> corona be gonna. I'm kidding, it's not Corona. We got a little bit of a cough, but hey, uh, I want to encourage you to run, to run, to run with ministry. So you got to run with a covering. If you're going to run with the horses in this hard time. You got to run with a covering. You got to run with ministry, doing ministry, serving God, uh, building his church, walking out your God given purpose. Man, if you're not walking out your purpose today, you know, studies show that the number one thing to fight depression is if somebody is walking out their purpose, if they feel like they're doing what they're supposed to do with their life. And I, I think that's a word for somebody today that God wants you to be walking out your purpose, to be doing what God created you to do, not just where your career path has happened to take you. Do what God created you to do. Run with ministry. Number three, this is the, just the checklist. We gotta run, we gotta run with grace. We gotta run with grace. Run with grace, you know, in 2020, this year has been filled with so much turmoil and so much division, and there would be a lot of ways that you and I can live. And to be honest, with so much division and so much fighting, it's so easy for you and I to get caught up in that. And for us to get caught up in the way of the world. But Paul says at the end time, he gives us this checklist of like, this is what you do at the end time. And, and, he's, and, and he teaches us that we need to 
We need to run with grace. We don't need to run, like, like, like there's all these other great words, like, like, like we could run with mercy, we could love, run with justice, but no, no, he says to run with grace. I wanna show you what he says. He says this, he says, see that no one pays back evil for evil. Man, sometimes I feel like paying back evil for evil. You know, like sometimes I feel like when people are, the stuff people are tweeting and posting these days and, and the violence, some people are cheering on violence. That's paying back evil for evil. Paul says, see, see that no one, meaning no Christians, no one who's following Jesus should ever pay back evil for evil. In fact, not only should we not do evil back to people, but he says, but always try to do good to each other. What? Not only do we not do bad, but actively do good. So not only do we passively not do bad, but we actively do good. Meaning that we actually give a gift. We bless somebody, we help out our enemy. People who are evil and against us, we bless and we try to help and do good to them. Man, this is so contrary to the culture we're living in today. So before you send that tweet that's divisive, before you post that post, before you make that comment, before you, you feed the fire of evil fighting evil, friend, we gotta have a little bit of grace. Dr. King, he's so brilliant. He said, he said, you know, he said, darkness doesn't drive out darkness. Only light can do that. If it's dark, you turn on a light, boom. That's the only way to get rid of darkness is to shine light. And he said, hate doesn't drive out hate. Only love can do that. Friends, we've gotta walk, we've gotta run with grace today. It, our world teaches us that people should get what they deserve. But friends, Christians, we don't do that. We don't give people what they deserve because you and I, we don't deserve heaven. And you and I, we don't deserve forgiveness. We don't deserve Jesus and we don't deserve heaven. But because of the goodness of God and because of the love of Jesus Christ, when we confess him as Lord and Savior and we turn from ourselves and we make him the king of our lives, we inherit, we receive grace and forgiveness, things we don't deserve. The world tells us to give people what they deserve. Let me tell you what running with grace looks like. This is my advice to you today. Don't give people what they deserve. Give people what they need. Friends, you and I, we didn't deserve heaven, but we needed heaven. We didn't deserve forgiveness, but we needed forgiveness. We didn't deserve mercy, but we needed mercy. And thank be to God that he gave us mercy, that he gave us heaven, that he gives us forgiveness. Friends, who can you give forgiveness to? Who can you give love to? Don't give people what they deserve. Give them what they need today. Run with grace. And my fourth point as we're closing today is that if we're gonna keep up with the horses, the end times, Revelation, I know it can be kind of spooky and I hope you're not discouraged and freaked out and weirded out. I'm trying to show you how the book of Revelation paints this beautiful, really artistic picture of what the end time will look like and, it, it'll, and what it'll feel like. And it'll feel like these, these spiritual horses of deception, of division, of plague, of death, of economic collapse. Of, of violence, it'll feel like all of that. And man, that's what the world feels like today. And Jeremiah, he says, you know, if you can't even run the race of life when you're running it against mankind, when you're running it against your daily schedule, what makes you think when the spiritual horses get here, when the end time gets here, when life gets actually hard, what makes you think you'll be able to run then? And that could sound discouraging. And there's a lot that we really deserve to be discouraged about. But this is why the, my fourth point today is my last point, and it's my most challenging point. Today, we've gotta to run with joy. We've gotta run with joy. If you wanna memorize a Bible verse today, it's a really hard one. I'm being a little bit sarcastic, very sarcastic. Verse 16, 1 Thessalonians 5. Always be joyful. In the chat, just say always, right, always. Say it out loud. Say it literally out loud with me right now. Say, always be joyful. Friends, always, that's hard. 
No, that's impossible. Always be joyful? My end time checklist. When the world is falling apart, you want me to always be joyful? What is that? I mean, right now, we have the right to be discouraged, to be angry, to be scared, to be fearful, but Paul says, always be joyful. What is joy? Because I don't feel joy always. I don't, I don't feel excited. Joy always? What are we talking about? Well, it sounds to me like joy must not be a feeling, but joy must be a foundation. It sounds to me like, 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 like joy it, it isn't about my circumstances. It sounds to me like joy is a choice. You see, if the Bible tells you to do something, like always be joyful, I want you to know something today, that this is both encouraging and incredibly challenging. Challenging because you and I, we both know that we do not do that. <laughs> Always joyful? Yeah, right. Challenging, but encouraging. Because if the Bible tells you to do something, it means that we have the capacity to do it. Meaning that God gives you and I access to a capacity to have joy even in the midst of the end times, even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of total collapse. There's a capacity. See, joy, it's not how you feel. It's a decision. It's a choice. It's a choice every single day to live for something greater. I love, I love in Nehemiah chapter eight, it says, don't be dejected and sad. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. If you're feeling weak today, maybe you need some joy. If you're feeling discouraged today, maybe you need some joy. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? Philippians 4, Paul again, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice. I love, I love, I love rejoice because, because like rejoy, meaning like you're not feeling joyful now, but like go ahead and go back to your joy. Rejoy. Again, I will say rejoice. Why does he say it a second time? Because he knows how quickly you and I can lose it. What's joy? Uh, I think the best definition that I could give you today is uh, is a great book by Kay Warren, Rick Warren's wife. She wrote a great uh, she wrote a great book on joy. She says this. She says joy is a determined choice to praise God in all things. Friends, that's so true today. Joy is a determined choice. It's not about our feelings. It's not about our circumstances. It's about a choice. We've got to run with joy. We've got to have a determined choice to praise God in all things. You know, my grandma, she's 92 years old. And just two years ago, my grandmother, she's strong, she's active, she's vibrant, she's alive. She would drive herself to wherever she went. She lives on her own. My grandfather has since passed. And, and just two years ago, she was living her life. She was driving every day. She was, she was solo woman, you know, boss lady. Don't mess with her. It's my Nana. Absolutely incredible woman. But two years ago, she wakes up one day paralyzed, mysteriously. Literally woke up, opened her eyes, unable to move. She came down with a really rare condition called Guillain-Barre syndrome. And when you're that old, it, it, it attacks your body. And long story short, She's been on a two-year recovery process now where she's trying to get motion back and, and, and she can get around, she can kind of hold things, but she really can't, really can't hold things with her hands, really can't press buttons with her fingers, can't walk on her own. In the last two years, she's been living in a home and you know, quarantine, of course, has struck our, 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 our nation and, and, and homes like hers are, are completely cut off from outside visitors, so my grandma, since the beginning of COVID, since the beginning of March, hasn't had a single visitor and has not left her bedroom, except to walk outside. They take her out to a little porch and she's stuck in this 10 by 10 room for the last several months. And you know what? My grandma, solid believer, been a part of the same church since she was a baby. Her whole life has been a part of one church, faithful woman of God. And every time I call her, she's got one of those cool Amazon devices where it just kind of comes on. It's just, it's the only way to be able to 
connect with her, just drop in on her. And every time I talk to her, man, she has every right in the world to be dejected and to complain and to talk about how lonely she is and to talk about all the problems. But you know what? You know what she always says? She says, you know what, man, I'm doing so much better than most. She says, you know what, like, compared to a lot of my friends here, I'm, I mean, I'm doing great. I'm just so thankful to see you today. My grandma, she's learned a secret to this life. But even in the hardest time, she's learned to choose joy, to run this race with joy. She's decided that she's not gonna let the circumstances of life take the joy from her. No, 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 she's gonna run with perseverance. She's gonna run with the horses. Even though she is sitting in a wheelchair right now listening to this sermon and because she loves me so much, even though you're sitting there, Nana, I mean, you're so incredible because I know that you choose joy every single day and that's what you and that, that's what all of us need to do today. We need to run with joy, we need to choose it. We need to make the determined choice to praise God in all things. To say, you know what, God? Man, I'm so thankful that you have me here for such a time as this. In fact, it's a decision to, to, to say, God, I'm so thankful. God, that you have given me a covering. God, that you're so thankful that you've placed me into a church, that you've placed me in a city. God, I'm so grateful. God, would you help me submit to the, to the covering that I have today? It's a determined choice to praise God and to say, you know what? I want to live out my purpose, my ministry on this earth. I want to, I want to be serving the church, but no, I want to not just serve the church, but I want to be walking out my career and my, and my calling in this world, my mission in the world and my ministry in the church. It's praising God and, and saying, you know what? I'm not going to give people what they deserve. I'm going to give people People what they need. I'm going to run in grace and I am going to run with joy today for the joy of the Lord is our strength. I will rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. I'm saying it twice to remind myself that this is a choice, a determined choice to praise God in all things. Today, man, if you've been struggling to, walk, to live in joy in this season, and if you've been struggling to get under a covering, if you've been struggling to be walking out your purpose, man, if you've been struggling to, to, to be running in grace, if you've been struggling with these things, man, it's so simple, just come back to God today. Don't beat yourself up, don't get mad about, hey, you know what, let's leave the past in the past. Let's forgive ourselves, because Jesus, he forgives you. If you're willing to humble yourself and repent. In fact, I wanna invite you to, to a fresh commitment to the call of God on your life. I wanna invite you to a fresh relationship with Jesus Christ. Today, right where you're at, maybe you would say, Pastor, I'm in right relationship with Jesus. If that's you, then I want you to join me in praying for our friends who would say, Pastor, today, I'm not in a right relationship with Jesus. Because friends, the end is coming. And Jesus is real, God is real, heaven is real, hell is real. In the end, maybe it's not today, maybe we're not living in it now, but you and I, we will not live forever. And Jesus says that you and I can have eternal life, that we can have forgiveness from our sins, that we can have a fresh start, not just in heaven, but a fresh start here today. Jesus says, come and follow me. I'll give you rest for your soul. He says, come and follow me and you'll have life and life more abundantly. That's life today. The Bible tells us that if we confess that Jesus is Lord, meaning that he's in charge, and we believe in our heart, that he is who he says he is, that he died on the cross, that he rose again, that he is God. That if we do those two things, that if we confess it and if we believe it, then we're saved. And that decision to make Jesus Christ our God, our Lord and our Savior and our King, that he's in charge now, means that we, to the best of our ability, are gonna repent. That means we are going to turn. We are going to turn from the way we were living to the way God is calling us to. We're gonna turn from our past Jesus says that, that, that our past is behind us. God tells us that our sins are as far as the east is from the west, that the old is gone, that the new is here, and God is doing something new in your life today. If you wanna give your life to Jesus, if you wanna start fresh today, if the end's coming and you know you're not in right relation with Jesus, today you can begin a new relationship with him. My grandfather, he would always say, Taylor, it's never too late to start again. I don't know what you've done, I don't know how guilty you feel like you are, how disqualified you think you are. Friend, those are lies from the pit of hell. It's never too late to start again. If you wanna give your life to Jesus, just silence yourself right where you're at and just pray something, something like this. Say, dear Jesus, I repent. God, I turn from my selfish ways. God, I don't wanna be in charge anymore. 
Jesus, I want you to be in charge. I confess that you are Lord, you are God. Help me follow you. God, in these turbulent times, God, would I grab hold of you? God, would I be able to run this race? Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, would you lead me? Jesus, I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Well, hey, if you just prayed that prayer, man, I am so, so, so honored that you would allow me and allow Trinity Home to be a part of that decision. Hey, if you're in the chat, would you congratulate our friends who just prayed that prayer? And if you just prayed that prayer, your next step is so simple. You prayed the prayer, but do this for me. Text the word Jesus to the number on the screen. Just text Jesus to 646-713-2393. If you do that, I'm gonna send you a book, which will just be a resource to help you in your walk with God. But more importantly, I'm gonna pray with you. And, and, and someone from our team is gonna reach out to you. They're gonna shoot you a text message, let you know that they love you and they're praying for you. And we just wanna make sure that we're covering you in this season. Hey, it's about being covered. That's why we're gonna run with covering. That's what Paul says is the first thing we've gotta do at the end times. We gotta honor our leaders, those spiritual leaders. So you gotta run with covering. Okay, you gotta run with ministry. It's time for you to get plugged in and to do what God's calling you to do on this earth, your mission in the world, but then your ministry in the church. If you don't know what that is, you can sign up for Growth Track. We'll help you figure that out. We gotta run with grace. Don't be like the rest of the world, fighting evil with evil in, in, on Instagram and social media. Leave that behind. Display some light, display some love, display some hope, and we're gonna choose joy. We're gonna run with joy every single day. If the Bible tells you you can do it, God will help you see it through. He will give you the ability to be able to do it. Friends, I love you so, so much. Again, text the number on the screen if you haven't done so already. But hey, I cannot wait to see you this Wednesday for prayer. We pray for one hour, Wednesdays at noon, every single week. Feel free to join us, no pressure. Would love to see you then. But hey, I'm coming back next week to give us the remaining five things of the checklist that God wants you and I to do, that you and I can just assess ourselves to make sure we're running with the horses. So I'll see you next week for part two with Run With The End In Mind. I love you so much. Until then, the best is yet to come. I love you like crazy. Do I sound congested? I feel congested. Okay, I'ma leave. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Okay, God bless, see you later. Okay, love you, bye-bye.